Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, our speaker, who speak about the long-term of the U.S. alliance with radical Islam, which should fascinate us all. Uh, Rob is a senior lecturer at the uh, Corbell School of International Studies at DU. He's also been a staff person and volunteer for Peace Corps, and in uh, Tunisia and in Algeria, he's written extensively about both of those areas. He's also published in uh, Foreign Policy in Focus and Counterpunch. He's on the board, he's a board member of the Maghreb Center in DC and Open Democracy and the Center for Middle East Studies in, in DU, at DU. Uh, he's got a regular radio program on KGMU with Imam Ibrahim Kazarani, who many of us here know. And he's locally a volunteer for a Front Range Jewish Voice for Peace and the Colorado Coalition Against Attacking Iran. So um, I'm happy to uh, present to us all Rob Prince. start by uh, giving you some publicity about the Colorado Coalition um, against bombing Iran. There's a whole series of events. I'll only mention one. And that is an event called Blooms, Not Bombs, <laughs> which is going to take place at uh, the Corbell uh, Center at the University of Denver. And the speaker is a man named Panayati Kaleidis, who is a world-class expert on the plants of Central Asia and Iran. And you know the subtitle of the event is "These are the plants we're going to bomb, and we hope we don't bomb." Yeah. So I, uh, it really is going to be uh, essentially a botany discussion, you know, with a few um, sarcastic remarks from me here and there. But he's really supposed to be something else. So I wanted to just pass that around. I hope you can make it, it's free. And then here's our uh, latest uh, publicity little leaflet that we try to give out. Um, uh, Friends of Seville is one of the supporting organizations of, uh, of this coalition. All right, well look, uh, thank you. Yes? Well, Panayoti Kolaidis runs the Botanic Gardens. Yeah, she's, he's really, <laughs> Uh, um, he's a big, he's a big, uh, yeah, and, I, and I've heard a number of things that it comes from um, one of the more interesting towns in the mountains of Colorado, one of these mining towns that it is probably as diversified or more culturally diversified than Denver, Oak Creek, where they're still mining. Uh, but uh, whatever, he's gone from Oak Creek and he's considered a world authority uh, on these issues. So we're fortunate to have him in Denver. Uh, I, I mean it, I'm, uh, I'm honored to begin this speaker series. Uh, and um, uh, I had hoped uh, to do it with, with my good friend, uh, Ibrahim Kazaruni. And in fact, this is the third uh, in a, a series of talks on this subject. And we, we usually uh, do it together. And, and uh, I had been waiting for Ibrahim at home, and it turned out that he, he contracted the flu, wow. and so he can't make it. Um, we are usually referred to, let's see, he's refer referred to as the quirky imam. <laughs> and and uh, in more polite terms, I've been referred to as the self hating Jew. <laughs> so the quirky imam and the self hating Jew. <laughs> All right, so as, I mean, you know, so many friendly faces here. Uh, we've all been through this together. It's not just me. Um, there's nothing quirky about Ibrahim Kazaruni. All right. He is one of the, quite frankly, one of the great and humane minds among us. And as you know, a veritable expert on the Middle East. On its history, its culture, its current, complex political developments. And as for myself, I'm not a self-hater. In fact, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate my 
myself. I don't hate Judaism. Uh, and it's kind of a strange term. And usually I don't even refer to it uh, in most of my talks, but I'm getting tired of hearing it. Um, you know, what, why use a term like that? Really, it's used to try to intimidate people like myself, Jewish people, all right? Um, and particularly those, obviously, that have been critical of Israel's cruel and unexcusable treatment of the Palestinians, right? And have in part, and in part, partly, precisely because of our Jewish heritage, that we oppose the occupation, and we do it openly. So it is not that I am a self-hating Jew, and it is uh, those who use such language. In the end, all it is is an apology for occupation. All right, we don't need to dwell on that, but um, that's how I begin. Um, and as I look around here, I um, am reminded that it's precisely here that the Colorado chapter of Friends of Seville was founded. I don't, how many years ago? I, I don't even remember exactly. Seven, seven. About seven, all right. Um, it was um, a wonderful event, all right. It was big, but hundreds of people that attended. And I simply want to begin by underlining my respect and my affection for this organization and for what it's done, for its presence here in Colorado. You two have been unfairly smeared. Okay, as anti-Semites and worse. Now we all know that this is complete and utter nonsense. All right? Um, and that the Anti-Defamation League that tried to sabotage the founding conference here and undermine the work of Friends of Seville would do far better to watchdog groups like John Hagee's Christians United for Israel yes. and other anti-Semitic organizations, rather than targeting an organization like Friends of Seville, from its beginnings until today, that has done everything in its power to oppose all forms of discrimination, whether it be against Muslims, Christians, and Jews. All right? So I guess that's the do. So I simply want to start by saluting you for the work that you've done, for your efforts, and also for what I know has been your frustrating efforts to strengthen your ties with the mainstream Jewish community. Keep doing it, keep trying, you're on the right track. I know it's not easy, but it's worth it. All right, so two days uh, from today is uh, September 11th. And um, as you all know, it's become something of a national day of tragedy. Of course, there are many lessons one can learn from the tragedy of 9-11, very few of which, it seems, uh, have been learned either by the Bush administration or by the Obama administration. The lessons have been hijacked. Instead of a sober day of reflection, a day to think about what's wrong, what's immoral, but changeable in U.S. foreign policy. It has provided a pretext for U.S. policy shifts. A, a lot of the stuff was already underway. Right? It wasn't that 9-11 had started that, but it has intensified so much since. It's a boom to the military industries. Some of the most important ones are located here in Colorado. A further militarization of U.S. foreign policy. It has been used to justify torture, assassination as a matter of foreign policy, with a president who approves mur murder by remote control. Supposedly, he does it on Sundays. Okay, that's what, that's what, that's what he said. Um, is he approving uh, targets today? 
as we speak? Is he fluctuating between watching football games and signing off on targeted killings? All right. We've gone to the point where the killings of former heads of state, political or political opponents, Saddam, Gaddafi, Osama bin Laden, are just par for the course. If you look at how they were all killed, it was a quite brutal, quite brutally, uh, 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 in a very humiliating fashion, summarily assassinated, killed like dogs. Their deaths and the killings, for the most part, cheered on by the American people. So much so that a presidential hopeful makes a campaign issue out of these murders. There is something obscene about this and suggests a new level of barbarism in US foreign policy. I honestly don't like to use language like this, but I am abhorred uh, with what I'm seeing. And international law, the Geneva Accords, be damned. All right. Now, of course, the, the, the excuse, the pretext for this intensification is the war on terrorism, which despite government denials to the contrary, is based largely on what has become the Islamic fundamentalist threat, a card played in the most cynical fashion most everywhere. And let us remember that even the US invasion of Iraq was linked supposedly to the connection between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden, although there was none. Much of the current opposition to the creation of a Palestinian state today is expressed through the fear of a Hamas government coming to power, and more on, on that later. OK, and for all that, there's, there's a, a very interesting dichotomy that Ibrahim and I began to explore, and that it often goes unnoticed. And that is how the United States um, treats Islamic fundamentalism. Specifically, it is treated, as everyone in the room knows, as the enemy at home. Mosques are spied on. Muslims are picked off the street and integrated, uh, uh, picked off the street. And basically, what, what, a lot of, what a lot of this has been is to turn them into spies. Uh, so they go back to the mosque, and uh, you know, because they're so afraid they're going to get uh, sent, sent away. Um, mostly in an effort to turn them into FBI moles. Acts of violence against Muslims, mosques, and the pervasive atmosphere of anti-Islamic and anti-Arab racism is everywhere. Americans have been conditioned to fear Arabs and Muslims. Of course, this predates 9-11, but was greatly intensified since. The strange thing is that the enemy at home is often the ally abroad, especially in the Middle East. It's very curious, but well documented trend that in many places and for decades, the United States has funded, given arms to, trained, given political support, either overtly or covertly, to radic radical Islamic fundamentalism. All right. Further, that this relationship has been critical to US regional goals, control of oil, natural gas, challenging democratic movements, including the Arab Spring, protecting strategic choke points. Let us be clear about a number of points concerning Islamic fundamentalism. All the major religions have politicized tendencies. They all have, quote, fundamentalists, right? Christianity has its John Hagee. Christian Zionists who would like to promote a Middle East war, basically say it openly, in order to speed the second coming of Christ. You're, many of you are aware of this. Christians united for Israel 
is nothing short of the emerging face of fascism in America. All right, again, I know it sounds like a weighted statement. Look into it. You'll see it is not an exaggeration. These are very, very spooky people. Liberal Zionists should be ashamed to be in an alliance with such right-wing zealotry and political trash. But they defend it. Judaism, we have our fundamentalists too. The zealot settlers who claim the West Bank, and actually much more than that, um, all the land between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates as given to, God, to Jews by the God. Let us again state here and state it unequivocally that this notion is completely bankrupt. It is, a racist, it is racist to the core and should be openly opposed by everyone. Not only, not only including Jews, but certainly Jewish people, we have a special responsibility to challenge that. And then there is Islam, a religion of more than one billion people throughout the world. Islamic fundamentalism is actually a very small element in the larger picture, but it does exist and is growing due to certain specific courses. While it takes a number of forms, Islamic fundamentalism today in the Middle East mainly has two trends, two larger trends. One is referred to as Wahhabism, and the second is referred to as Salafism. So Wahhabism and Salafism. Um, Wahhabism, uh, they're not exactly the same thing. Um, Salafism is older. Actually, Salafism has a history that probably goes back to about 850 AD. It's a very, very old trend. But basically, what is Salafism? Salafism is uh, uh, going back to the sources, to the origins, i.e., to the Quran, uh, and using the Quran basically as the basis for not just the religion but everything else. It's you know more more, more than a uh, more than a religion. Um, uh, of course, all Muslims use the Quran as a source. So it becomes a, a question of interpretation. Um, and here's where things get a little sticky. Like other forms of fundamentalism, Salafism assume, assumes that its interpretation of Islam is the only one. Right? That's, it's the only one, all right? And the others are all blasphemy. All right, through, and through this kind of logic, it delegitimizes all other Muslims, all right? So Sufism, forget it, right? Uh, and in fact, what are the Salafists doing today in Mali? Destroying uh, Sufi monuments in, uh, in, in, in Timbuktu? Um, Shia, the, the Shiite uh, uh, trend within Islam, uh, far as the Salafists are concerned, Shiites are not Muslims. Um, so, so, I mean, again, uh, we, we do have a basis of comparison in that both the Jewish and the Christian fundamentalists, there are movements like that. If you're not our kind of Christian, you're not really a Christian. Uh, I remember my, uh, my daughter at the time we were going to, uh, for a short period, went to the Unitarian Church out there in Jefferson County, and her, friend, uh, her friends were calling her devil worshipers. Uh, the Unitarians were dev devil worshippers, you know. So, so, so yes, Christians, you know, we have the same thing. But, but this trend in Salafism, um, it was mostly a uh, um, within the religion itself, within the religious community. Beginning in the late 19th century, Salafism becomes politicized, and becomes a much more uh, politically active active trend. So what's the difference between that and Wahhabism, as it's referred to? Well, Wahhabism, um, although it has many of the aspects of Salafism, uh, is a specifically Saudi form uh, of, of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, its founder was one Muhammad ibn uh, Abdul Wahhab, who was an 18th century Sunni theologian. Um, and who felt already in the 18th century that Islam was being influenced by too many outside influences, meaning Christianity and 
uh, uh, to a certain extent Judaism even, uh, and tried to, quote, purify the religion. Um, Wahhab made an alliance with what was then a very small and insignificant clan, um, which was called the Sa'ad clan. And from that point on until today, the Sa'ad family and the Wahhab family have been closely connected to each other, tied, uh, tied, tied through marriage. And Wahhabism is, is, uh, is, the official, um, is the official religion of Saudi Arabia. Um, it is like uh, the more gener generic uh, uh, Salafism, Wahhabism is fiercely intolerant. You know, it's our, it's our way or the, high, or the highway. And again, its main target, uh, is, it's, not, it's not Christians and Jews, it's other Muslims. It's other Muslims, the other, the, the other Islamic trends. Um, and uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the history of Saudi Wahhabism is nothing short of genocide against its, its own opponents. Uh, we don't know the numbers of people that were slaughtered. For the, uh, and the consolidation of the Saudi state between, uh, between 19, or approximately 1900 and 1940. But some of the figures I've seen are somewhere between 50 and 100,000. All right, that doesn't usually uh, come up. All right, so uh, Salafism has the older history, Wahhabism is a little bit younger. Um, they cooperate with each other. There's a competition between them. I mean, this is the thing about all fanatics, right? You know. Um, but, but for tactical reasons, uh, uh, these, these two movements are very, very closely related, related uh, today. And the, these two movements are the main source of what, of what we would call um, militant Islamic fundamentalism. All right? So, and culturally speaking, and here again, I, I don't use these terms lightly, all right? Uh, I, I feel like it's, you have to be a little careful calling a religious trend retrograde. Um, but I don't know how else to call it. All right, I don't know how else to call it, and I think it needs to be called out in public. Let me, let me cite one example. Um, the idea uh, that somehow or another uh, Islam and the, and the Quran support the inferiority of women. All right, there is nothing in the Quran Nothing, all right, that suggests that women should wear a veil. It's not there. No mention whatsoever of a veil. There's nothing whatsoever that, uh, saying that they should be inferior to their husbands. It's not there. And in fact, um, uh, uh, the life of, of, of Khadijah, of, of Muhammad's wife, uh, is an example of a kind of an independent, uh, independent woman who, who uh, you know, is very active in, in both social and, 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 politi and political life. Um, so uh, it's, not, um, it's not the Quran that, uh, uh, you know, that perpetrates such views. And it is not modern Islam that has twisted the role of woman, but it's a Salafist, Wahhabist approach that has. And one could take that example and we can see that again and again and again. Um, all right, so all right, I don't think I've said anything that most of you, are, at least in some ways, weren't familiar with. All right, um, what's 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 the missing link here? The missing link is what does this have to do with U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East? All right, and the answer is, or well, the one-word answer is, a lot. <laughs> And it always has, all right? And this, this uh, you know, think about this. And of course, being, being involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, uh, um, having to deal locally, nationally, with organizations like APEC, uh, uh, and I have to deal with them too, <laughs> believe me, um, and, the, and the ADL, and hearing uh, uh, a little bit too often even that, uh, that we have a special relationship with Israel, the US, the, the government, well, of course it does. But that's well known. We have another special relationship. And no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, but it's hardly ever talked about. And there's another lobby, all right? And it has, I would argue, great power. 
And once again, it's the, Saudi, it's the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. All right. Now, when one talks about the relationship with Israel, the US relationship with Israel, what do we hear? We are oh, common cultural this and that, uh, connection, democracy, and all that. There's something missing, though, from the very beginning until today with this US-Israeli relationship. It has nothing to do with oil. It's not, it doesn't have oil, all right? The US-Saudi relationship, I think, might have something to do with oil, all right? Now, from a strategic and ec economic point of view, doesn't that carry some weight? U.S. foreign policy? Wouldn't you think that we would have heard a bit more about this U.S.-Saudi relationship over time? You know what happens when you venture out, you show a little courage, write an op-ed, you criticize Israel. OK, right? The last time I did that, the American Jewish Committee Sent, uh, sent a formal letter to the dean of my program saying that I should be fired. Yeah. All right. In fact, they also sent a letter to the chancellor saying that the dean should be fired because the dean at that time had called Gaza an open air camp. All right, so, all right, so you're all familiar with this. You, you stick your nose out and you know what happens. Try saying something about Saudi Arabia. See if it gets published. All right. Uh, or just, you know, try this as an experiment. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, i.e., there are, there are suggestions, hints, if you think about it, that something's going on there, even if we even if we uh, we don't we don't uh, we don't think about that. I wanted to talk about how this relationship came together, and actually, in studying the relationship. Um, what, and when I say we, I'm usually talking about Ibrahim because we've really been doing this research together. What we, what we ha came across is how old it was. All right, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but even before there's a U.S. Saudi relationship, there's a British Saudi relationship. Now, Britain had a lot of options, and, and the Saudi relationship was not the only lever, if you like, that it, it chose in the days when um, it had more influence and power in the Middle East. But it's quite clear, if you, if, you study, if you study the emergence of Saudi Arabia, it would not have happened without British support, period. And what was it they were looking for? <laughs> they weren't looking for the most modern, uh, the most uh, 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 kind of modernizing trend, <coughs> either politically or, or, or religiously in the Arab world. They were looking for the family that they could buy off the most easily. All right? And they decided rather early on that that was the Saud family. And already, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the Saads were, were defeated and chased from what today we call Saudi Arabia and forced in the late 1800s to retreat to Kuwait. And it looked like that, uh, that the whole movement was about to collapse, at which time, with the help of British arms, training, and political advice, the, uh, the, the founder of this dynasty, Ibn Saud, okay, makes a, it was a, a bold uh, uh, attack on Riyadh. Uh, retakes Riyadh, and this is the beginning of, of, um, of, of Saud's of Saud's rise to power. Um, so it wouldn't have happened. So right there we see that, that um, Islamic fundamentalism, and the British knew, and I would argue still know, an awful lot more about Islam than, than um, American intelligence and State Department and stuff like that. They were really far more, th the British and the French have always been, when it comes to their intelligence agencies and they're, they're, if you like, they're anthropologists and stuff like that, much more uh, knowledgeable about who it, who it is that they're colonizing, all right, and how to do it. And that's why we're still dependent upon them to this day. Um, in terms of the United States, the relationship 
It's not a strategic relationship in the beginning. Uh, an agreement is reached in the 1930s, very famous, uh, giving the United States uh, Standard Oil uh, an opportunity to, to dig for oil. At the time, it wasn't clear. Oil was discovered. It's a great boom. But the, the cementing of the strategic relationship takes place at the end of World War II in a meeting between Ibn Saud and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It takes place on a US destroyer just south of the southern rim of the Suez Canal. And um, I want to read you a description of that meeting. This is from Michael T. Clare's book. On the one side, the acknowledged leader of the allied powers and a passionate defender of democratic ideals. Slightly overstated, but not too much. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. On the other side, an absolute monarch who had never traveled further from home than neighboring Kuwait and adhered to an extremely strict form of Islam. Among Saud's entourage of advisors, 45 in all, were Bedouin bodyguards, a coterie of slaves, and two royal astrologers. OK. Uh, a Saudi uh, human rights uh, 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 scholar, uh, his name is Assad Abu Khalil. And he's got a very good website. It's called Angry Arab. Well, it's, uh, mostly it's good. Occasionally, yeah, that's not bad you know, for a blog. Um, but uh, he adds a little texture to this meeting. It was the first time that Ibn Saud, Saud excuse me, 69 at the time, had met a non-Muslim head of state. There were unlimited accounts of the 69 sheep that Ibn Saud insisted on accompanying him on, on the US ship, OK, um, that he took to meet the American president. As Ibn Saud finished watching a US propaganda documentary while his sons were watching non-documentaries non without their father's knowledge, he commented about the movies. I doubt whether my people should have moving pictures like this. It would give them an appetite for democracy and entertainment that would distract them from their religious duties. All of Ibn Saud's successors have agreed with him. And to this day, movies are not permitted in Saudi Arabia. All right. What does this relationship over oil have to do with Salafism, with the, with the religious component? So what, what were the parameters of the agreement? One, that the United States would support the Saudi family in power in exchange for the free flow of oil at, at conditions, prices uh, uh, favorable to the United States and the Western oil companies. With one exception, which I could talk about later if you want, because I think it was the biggest deal of the last 50 years. I call it the Kissinger deal. It was, it was the 1970, after the 1973 uh, war when the price of oil went up. But it was basically a deal that was crafted between, between Kissinger and the, and, 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 and the Saudis. Um, the Saudis have been. Um, uh, have never failed, well, except for that one time, but even then, have never failed the United States in, ter in terms of being a partner in, um, in oil. That, the United, that US oil companies would dominate the relationship with Saudi Arabia, that's the second part. That Saudi Arabia would support in a general way US strategic interests in the region, which correspond to the Saudi regime's survival, <clears throat> and fourth, that in exchange for guaranteeing the flow of oil, the United States would not interfere with or concern itself with matters internal to the Saudi regime. The Saudi regime could continue its repressive political and religious policies without US interference. And here, the key is not only, I mean, you know you know the US record of supporting undemocratic governments wherever, all right? So there's nothing particularly new about that. But now we have 
we have a, uh, we have a government that is flushed with money, all right? I mean, enormous amounts of money uh, from oil profits. And some of that money is going into these religious institutions and, in, and is creating a whole cadre, if you like, of uh, Wahhabist clerics, scholars, or whatever. Now, um, there's a certain tension that has always existed between these uh, Wahhabist religious people and the royal family, because it seems that the royal family, in some ways, doesn't always follow the precepts of Islam uh, the way uh, um, particularly accurately. Um, if I remember right, there was a Saudi prince who had a home in Aspen. Uh, the, if I remember right, that the, the home cost 30, 30, 30 million dollars and he had a bowling alley in the basement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so you've got this tension, right, between the Islamic purists on the one hand and, and, and the, royal, the royal family on the other. How is it that the royal family has dealt with that tension? Okay, for the most part it, dealt, it deals with the tension by sending out of its country as many Wahhabist missionaries as possible, all right? So this way they get rid of the internal uh, problems that might, uh, might result uh, from the fact that the royal family is uh, you know, not following its, its Islamic P's and Q's. I just, now, this is not something that started last year. This has been going on for half a century, all right? And these, these Wahhabist missionaries are funded by the Saudi government. All right, well, 50 years later, what do we have? We, ha we have a whole network of Wahhabist, Salafist schools, mosques, and other, other, other institutions. These particular networks, from what I can tell, they are not in them themselves uh, um, the source of militant, radical uh, uh, Islam. But it is exactly from these institutions that the militants are recruited. So this is the, the sea, if you like, from which organizations like Al-Qaeda and, and, and others uh, re recruit. recruit. Um, OK, so the Saudi influence here has been, has been very, very great. And what it has done is it has changed the face of Islam in many places in the world, all right? Including Denver, Colorado. Because their, their grasp is, is, is rather, rather large. All right. Um, so that's, I mentioned this because this is the fundamental core relationship. There's a tendency on the part of many to separate what the Saudis are doing in the region and what the United States is doing. All right? So, oh, that's what Saudis, well, that's terrible. But, uh, and I, now I'm not just talking about you know, people on the street, but from my Peace Corps years, I have, I have um, so many of my friends from the Peace Corps went into the State Department. They became ambassadors. I just met several of them. They're, they're retired as ambassadors, OK? There's uh, one guy who keeps saying, I wasn't in the CIA. I wasn't in the CIA. I wasn't in the CIA. Uh, uh, I, I uh, remind him of the Shakespeare quote, that complaineth too much. Uh, all right. Um, and I had dinner with them uh, uh, about uh, several months ago with a whole bunch of them. Uh, one is a former deputy director of the Peace Corps. Okay, on a human level, I love them, all right? We're good friends. Uh, they try, you know, they try to be polite with me. Sometimes it's difficult. But we're, you know, we're lifelong friends, period. And uh, I respect them and they respect me. And they went on, at, several of them went on at length about, um, uh, the discouraging treatment of women that's emerging in Egypt and Tunisia. I'm very, very concerned about this. And, and also, and they take it the next step. And the next step is, and we know 
that, the, that these rising Salafist movements in Tunisia and in Egypt are being funded by Qatar, we could talk about that later, by Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia. Okay, true. All right, then you throw in the uncomfortable question. Isn't there some coordination between Saudi Arabia and the United States on Middle East policy? And that's where, you know, the, that's the blind spot. Oh, you know, there you go again, Rob, you know. All right, uh, um, and that's true, I did go again. Um, okay, so my starting point is, on the major questions, there is close coordination between the United States and Saudi Arabia on everything that's happening in the Middle East, whether it has to do with Iran, whether it has to do with Israel-Palestine, whether it has to do with the Arab Spring. And when we hear, for example, uh, uh, that Saudi Arabia is funding Islamists in Syria, all right, and then we try to separate, in Syria or in Tunisia, it doesn't, we try to separate that from US policy, it's simply not credible. It's simply not credible to me. These things are, are, are very, very tight. Okay, uh, um, let me take no more than 10 minutes. I, I, I really want it to be a dialogue. And as you see, I, it's hard for me, but I, it's important. I want to give you two examples, historical examples, um, of how this relationship has worked out and why, why, what that connection is about. The harder connection historically has been, it's not even that complicated. What were the democratic regimes like in the Arab world in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s? Right, they tended to be more or less secular. They were not completely secular. This is a misnomer. There were always uh, uh, Muslims and, 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 and Christian and Jewish groups that participated in these, in these democratic uh, movements. Um, you know, the role, of, the role of the Christians in Palestinian movement is very important. Uh, so, but still, they tended to be uh, more or less secular. Um, what kind of movements were they? Well, during the Cold War, they were defined as communist or pro-communist movements. Uh, virtually none of them were. It's true that in a number of countries, there were, uh, there were communist parties. Syria. Iraq, Egypt, they had communist parties, and these parties played some kind of role. But in the end, uh, it was never communism that attracted uh, the great majority of people in the Arab world. It was nationalism. What's the difference? What are we talking about here? OK, the nationalist movements in the colonial period, they're anti-colonial movements. Whether we're talking about, about uh, um, the movement in Algeria to get rid of the French, all right, which is a form of direct colonialism, or whether we're talking about the movement in Egypt to get rid of the British, which was a milder form in many ways, but still, in both cases, there's tremendous anti, uh, the, this was the source of the movement. And people didn't care, you know, whether you were a Muslim or a socialist uh, or whatever. That was the unifying force. Uh, and that was the force that brought forth these new political movements and new political parties. Okay, um, that, then we come to the independence period, i.e. Uh, 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 the most uh, um, obvious forms of colonialism are, uh, are eliminated. Uh, Algeria gains its independence, the British are kicked out of, <coughs> out of Egypt, the French out of Syria, et cetera, et cetera. However, then we have a new, very complex uh, period where the countries are, ec are politically independent, but still very much tied economically to what was the former colonial power. All right, All right. and that is, I call it sneaky colonialism. Uh, it's got another form, you know, it's referred to as neo-colonialism. Okay, in the post-independence period, the nationalist movements are to, what are they trying to do? To gain space to control their own economies and their own political destinies. All right, until five years ago, or whatever. Um, that, that was pretty much those movements. All right, it's those movements that the United States was very concerned about. Let us, let us take a look at the Palestinian issue here. I mean, no oil. 
Right, Israel doesn't have war. Palestine has less. Whatever Israel has, Palestine has less, right? Okay. Uh, no, uh, no, no. What are we we're not talking about economic interests here at all. There's, this isn't what, what uh, the United States is concerned about. So why is the United States, why has it been for the duration of the lives of virtually everybody in this room, this hostility that the United States has had towards Palestinian nationalism, if we're not talking about the economic interests? What do you think? All right. It's got to be more than APEC. Absolutely. Well, uh, my explanation is this. This is a region where political uh, uh, energy flows from one place to another. So the, the threat of Palestinian nationalism is not the threat of uh, somehow US or French British economic interests being uh, undermined, but that in the countries where those interests are strong, that the movement will will flow, the, the nationalist movement will flow into those areas. So that's why Palestinian nationalism has to be, has to be countered, all right? It has to be countered. Well, maybe, it'll, you know, maybe the Saudis will, will have a movement similar to the Palestinian movement. And you could see, if you look at the great movements, the great political movements in the Arab world, they start in one place and they wind up going everywhere. Whether we're talking about the Nasserist movement of the 50s and 60s, all right? Or whether we're talking about the Arab Spring that starts in Tunisia and the Tunisians are rightly proud of, and it flows everywhere. So that, that I believe that that's the problem in, in terms of Palestinian nationalism. The broader problem is it's, it's not at all clear, well, what would the nationalists do if they came to power? And it's this ambiguity of not being sure what the Syrian or the Saudi or the Iranian, we know what the Iranian nationalists did, don't we, in 1953. Um, but it's that ambiguity, the fear that what most of that did in Iran by nationalizing the oil industries, that that will somehow follow in the other Arab countries, although the Arab nationalisms were quite different. So what the response is Arab nationalism has to be if not crushed, which is what they would have preferred, tamed. Well, how do you tame it? We know how they tried. In Egypt, as soon as Nasser came to power, actually, again, it goes deeper than that. The United States develops a relationship with the Muslim Brotherhoods. Early on, it's a, it's a, the, the, these relationships, most of the time, they're covert. But like so many other things, if we give, with history, the, there are very few facts that we, we can't somehow learn about. Uh, um, there's a quote. It's the only quote I ever used by Stalin, who I, I have no love for. But it's a good quote. Facts are stubborn things. He should know. All right? Facts are stubborn things. All right. So the idea is uh, give the Islamicists their head, so to speak, meaning fund them, either openly, which was done, or uh, directly uh, through the US Embassy, or use that roundabout way, which is you know, a little bit harder to find, but it's been going on all the, through the Saudis, uh, uh, through, through, through the Qataris, and use them to do what? To attack the nationalist movement, all right? To split that movement. Any relationship to the Palestinian movement? I think so. All right, I think so. Those of you who know your history, you'll hear, you'll hear this thing that Israel, Israel uh, started Hamas. Right? Israel did not start Hamas, but Israel did not stop Hamas once it, once it, once it took some kind of form, all right, uh, um, from growing into something. Why? Split the Palestinian movement. There's no way that a split Palestinian movement has the political weight. Uh, to get to get what to get what it needs, so we begin seeing this pattern um, of the funding of Islamic fundamentalism uh, uh, already uh, in the in the Egyptian uh, Egyptian period, and basically it's to tame or to try to counter uh, the growth of Egyptian nationalism, which, as many of you know, in those days was 
was really a very dynamic force, so to speak, uh, in the world. All right, let me finish up with the Arab Spring. Um, I think I've, I've told many of you this, that people have asked me, this is before the Arab Spring, why are you studying Tunisia? Right? Yeah. Little country. Who cares about, I, I've actually had people say it that way. Uh, you know, others say, ah, you know, you're tired of the Israeli-Palestinian thing, you're gonna, <laughs> all right, I'll never tire of that. All right, period, okay? Uh, having said that, so I'll tell you why I, I focus on Tunisia. One, the most important period of my life took place in that little country. Not worth going through, but that's what changed me. All right, it's Tunisia, all right, okay. And I am grateful and will be until the day I die to the Tunisian people for all the things they taught me in two and a half years. Okay. The other reason, I mean, I'm a, I guess I what I'm called a political scientist. To be quite frank, I am so bored with studying big countries. <laughs> They're so predictable. <laughs> Our country is predictable. China is predictable. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union is predictable. They are. The little countries of the world, they are really interesting. You go to these, you know, think, think of uh, the little European countries like Holland. You go there, they don't speak two or three languages, they speak six. I was once, I was once at a party with a guy from Luxembourg, he spoke 12 languages. I went around following him. All right, Fo you know, okay. All right, but here's the deal with these small countries. A lot of us think, oh, well, that small country, you know, it's, it's to the right or it's to the left. Mostly what small countries are trying to figure out is which way is the wind blowing so we don't get blown away. All right? You, you make the wrong choice. It's not an ideological choice for the most part. You know, you're just trying to figure out what's going on. All right? I.e., the, the politics in small countries is absolutely fascinating. All right? They have to be far more sophisticated uh, uh, than, than the law. Okay, that, that interests me. And, and uh, there are two countries that in my, in my work in political economy I follow. One is Tunisia and the other is Finland. And by the way, Finland made a wrong decision in World War II. You know, it's watching the war. Boom, boom. You know, Germany's over here, Russia's over there. Okay, what was the early prognosis in Finland? Ah, the, the Germans are going to win. We'll ally with them. Finland was not a fascist country. The middle of the war, there was a little battle, right? It's called Stalingrad. After the battle of Stalingrad, the Finns go to Moscow and say, we give up. The wind changed, all right? This wasn't, okay, so I mention this because um, I find it fascinating and the fact that nobody would read what I wrote, I was used to that anyhow. Uh, <laughs> And my students had no choice but to listen to me. And it was interesting. OK, boom. Then uh, this poor young, this tragic tale of a young man who burns, burns himself to death, right? Muhammad Bazizi in, in Tunis takes place, and the Arab Spring explodes. Um, know this. And this just comes from, from research that I, I have done uh, uh, since then. Before Mohammed Bouazizi burnt himself, there were 50 others who burnt themselves. All right, there were immolations all over the Middle East. Big ones in Morocco, in Egypt, but in, in Yemen. All right, so interesting question that I cannot answer. Why this one at that moment that provokes the explosion? Right, the explosion happens. What was the beginning of the Arab Spring about and what was it not about? It was not a debate over Islam. In no country, in no country where the Arab Spring started was the, were, were the issues religious. Now by this, I don't mean that it was anti-religious. The issues were clear and simple and they were three. One, economics. High levels of unemployment, no job opportunities for um, uh, for 
youth graduating from universities, uh, um, low salaries for those that do have jobs, almost unlivable. All right, second was corruption. The levels of corruption, you know, gold medal, Olympic medals of corruption. You know, in, in, in my teaching, I would talk about some of the corrupt third world leaders of the 1980s. You know, my favorite one was always Imelda Mar Marcus. I, I, I really did go after her for her 3,000 pairs of shoes. All right. But the Marcoses were only worth $2 billion. Okay, Mobutu from Zaire, you know? I mean, really a well-skilled kleptomaniac. Um, $3 billion. And the Congo, extraordinarily wealthy country. Little Tunisia with no natural resources, really. The two families, Ben Ali, Trabelsi family, $17 billion they took out of that country. All right? Leaving, leaves Mobutu and, and, and Marcos in the dust. What's the, what's the amount of money that they're quoting for Egypt? Then have, you see, have any of you seen the amount of money that, that somewhere around $70 billion. All right, now look, the, for, we'll never really know the, detail, the details of this. But the corruption was pervasive, and this was the second, the second cause, all right? The third cause was repression. You know, these countries were torture, torture industries. People were picked up off the street for virtually nothing. If you did something, it was even worse. So, economic privation, corruption, uh, and, and complete lack of democracy, uh, and put in the context of a youth who see no future. So, uh, so we have these rebellions. We have these rebellions. Th these rebellions from are generally, they're spontaneous from what I could tell. Um, they're not left or right. They're a new kind of rebellion. They're rebe the, the heart of the rebellion is about dignity. All right. Muslims are involved. Uh, everyone, this is the early phase. So think about that and think about and I know all of us were so excited. My gosh, it's, it's happening. And you know, dealing with all these racist stereotypes, Arabs can't, you know, Arabs aren't gonna be democratic, and all that nonsense. And here, this explosion of democracy, beautiful, and whatever happens, by the way, it is, it's a beautiful thing, what happened. Look at it today, in Tunisia, an Islamic government, all right? In Egypt, an Islamic government. Um, a rebellion in Syria that's in every way tragic. There's no, uh, there's no good guys in Syria. Of course, the government's not a good guy. But those rebels, not very interesting either, if you look more closely. All right. Um, what it looks like is happening. You know, this rebellion's breakout. The United States is pretty nervous about them. It doesn't know where it's going. What is it that the United States is concerned about? It's concerned about two things, all right? One, will the resulting governments remain in the U.S. strategic alliance, okay, i.e., will they permit NATO, U.S. military, all that kind of, whatever, whatever those arrangements, will that remain the same? The second thing the United States is concerned about is Will the new governments permit economic intervention the way it took place before the rebellions, i.e., open economies, uh, um, uh, accepting World Bank and IMF uh, structural adjustment type, uh, type situations? Okay. There, that wasn't clear in the beginning, but as, as those um, uh, those two themes become clear that in, in Tunisia, Egypt, and wherever, that, that these, these two themes will not be challenged, that's when the United States got a little bit more relaxed about, about what was going on. I see the role of, of Salafism and, is, and Islamic fundamentalism is today being more or less the same thing that it was in Egypt. It's to, it's to, to divide what was a, a, a united movement, a kind of coalition forces, um, in such a way 
that whatever the program of these countries might have been, because we'll never know, it'll never, it'll never, you know, never appear. And that's what looks like what is happening here. So what we see is um, we see a historic consistency, uh, an adaptation, as I see it, to to new conditions. They're a little bit a little bit different. A vilification of Islam at home and close alliances with this fundamentalism in virtually every country of the Middle East, one way or another. I stop there. Thank you very much. And. And let's have the dialogue I, I keep avoiding. All right, yes, thank you. I have a question. Sure. Be a naive one. No. Um, I was wondering if there is the belief that the Israelis support Hamas. I'm you know, um, what happens in a certain way, in a certain way, there's certain cooperation. But here's the deal in a broader sense, OK? We are dealing with so many conspiracies, <laughs> right? So many <laughs> uh, uh, strange relationships, right? I mean, what I've just talked about. I'm trying to defend the real, what seems to be a very strange hypothesis, all right? And, and so what do we tend to do? We tend, we tend to see conspiracies everywhere. And most of the time, we're right. There's a, a wonderful quote by, uh, by William Burroughs about paranoids. He said, what's a paranoid? A paranoid is just somebody who has all the facts. All right, OK. Uh, um, and so it's hard. It's really difficult. And, and then you're hearing so many theories from so many people, so many flaky theories from so many. So how do you separate those things out? In the case, uh, well, one, you have to be careful. Second, you have to kind of. There's no way around it. You've got to do serious research. And third, you've got to continually test your hypotheses. All right. What I think we can say about the relationship between Israel and Hamas is, number one, there's no question that when the Israelis were repressing the more democratic elements in Fatah, that Hamas was given a free hand in this early phase, i.e., there was a notion that Hamas could be used, again, to weaken the Palestinian movement. What happened to Hamas is what happens to Al-Qaeda. The, the force you're trying to control gets out of control. It gets out of, it gets out, becomes an independent force. There's a term for that, and the term is called blowback. All right? The, uh, it, the classic example of that is Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, you know, remember the good old days when he was our ally? And I, when I, I was living in Finland for, in the late 1980s, and um, I was working for a UN uh, NGO. An American journalist, the way you got to Afghanistan was you came to Finland, you went to Moscow, and you flew to Kabul. All right, believe it or not, I actually had fairly decent ties with the American embassy there. And journalists would come to me, and I'd say, well, look, I don't have any connections in Kabul. Let's go to the embassy. All right, and you know, set up, set up a relationship. This happened three, four times. The cultural attache says, yeah, we've got a guy you've got to speak to. He's our man in Afghanistan. His name was Osama bin Laden. That's the first time I heard it, Osama bin Laden's name. All right, so Osama bin Laden is in our camp as long as the war in Afghanistan is going on. OK, then it seems like he you know, moved away from us, so to speak. All right, i.e., now he's outside of our control. That has happened again and again and again. So, you know, very cynical relationship. Probably in the beginning, uh, um, uh, you know, he understood that uh, allying with the United States would mean money and influence and arms and all that kind of stuff. And then when the war was over, he split. Well, Hamas, Hamas, his history is similar. So there's some, there's some ties there. They're undeniable, okay? And then Israel loses control of the situation, and particularly after the election, right? OK, so now we're in a different ball game. Now, now uh, you know, the, the whatever you want to call it, the movement that, not, if you didn't create it, you encouraged it, now it's turning on you. So do you think that there could still be some interest among the Israeli 
you know, on what level do we talk about support of Hamas? We're talking about the intelligence agencies and the military, you know. Uh, uh, um, you know the, the Israelis relate to Hamas the same way we relate to here in the United States to Islamic fundamentalism. You, you talk to Israelis about Hamas, that's the great threat. So on a, on a, on a popular level, there's no support at all. But, uh, uh, you know, over time, you know, what do you watch to really figure out what's going on? So we're all trying to, so we read, we read, you know, whatever it is you read, and we talk to our friends, and I do the same thing. All right, more and more what I try to find out is, what are the intelligence agencies saying? What, where, where are the money flows going? And by the way, I'm not really great at, at you know, answering those questions, but that's what I look at, all right? I try to look at what seemed to me to be what's going on under the surface. It's hard, to it's hard to find that out. So what we, again, what we know is there's no question that early on, in a very cynical way, um, the Israeli government, mostly through uh, the Mossad, um, saw in Hamas a way to manipulate and to divide the Palestinian movement. They did a pretty good job of it, at least for a while. All right, other, yes. All right, look, good. Actually, I want to talk about this, so I'm glad you asked me. Um, I'll start this way. Uh, when in 2007, the occupation of the 67 territories is 40 years old. I've been doing this for 40, I mean, I don't, many of you have been, so it's not just me. And I write, an email to one of my closest friends, you know, kind of, I'm frustrated. 40 years, what have we accomplished? The situation's only got worse. Changes aren't coming at the pace I want. <laughs> the guy I write to is Irish. <laughs> so some of you get it. And he talks about it took us a little bit longer. <laughs> Sometimes it's not your pace. All right. I mentioned that as a prelude to in the last few years, there really uh, um, is a breakaway uh, from what was within the Jewish community. I call it the beginnings of a breakaway from the hegemony of organizations like APEC, the ADL. Now, it's real. All right, we can speak of J Street, and I'll talk more detail about that. We can, we can speak, uh, speak of, of Lerner. I don't think Lerner has to impress anybody. That guy has been out there, Rabbi Lerner. Uh, uh, all right, you know, he's difficult. He is. He's terrific. He, as we say in Yiddish, he's a real mensch. All right? <laughs> he is. All right. This tikkun, and there's, you know, I wind up in usually the most isolated one, Jewish Voice for Peace. But it has a base, too, among, among, among young Jewish kids. OK, so what's the strategy of, all right, now what, what can we say positive about J Street? And I can say something positive about it. They are serious about ending the occupation, even though they don't like to use the word, and creating a two-state solution. All right, that I believe. And for that, they take hits in the Jewish community. All right? Now, what is their tactics? Their tactic is stay away from the left. Okay? That's the tactic. Ah, if we stay away from the left, if we, if we unite with, you know, uh, uh, that really uh, subversive group, Friends of Sabil, or groups like it, we're going to be accused, i.e., they buy in to some of the intimidation. They do. All right? And the other thing that they try to do is they try to focus all their work in the Jewish community. They're not interested, as you, well you know, I think, in making, in making coalitions. Um, essentially, the, J Street, from my perspective, it tails the Democratic Party. All right? Uh, um, and that, as you know, has certain limitations. But, they are serious about this two-state stuff. They are serious about um, a place for the Palestinians, and I respect them, all right? I, I've never been a member. I've never wanted to join them. 
uh, and I haven't. But I'm in, di I'm in dialogue with them uh, quite a bit, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, critical, but it's private. Occasionally, I go after them in public, but not very often. All right, but I do. I think that they mean something. Tikkun, <laughs> Learner is a good guy, as again, and Tikkun is an interesting organization, and it's developed a certain following, uh, mostly on the West Coast, but but uh, uh, I think it's got some supporters uh, supporters here, and um, you know I don't agree with how Learner portrays the struggle between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, there's a bit of opportunism in that. But Lerner is much stronger on Palestinian rights than J Street is, uh, and, and consistently. I mean, this is what you need to look at. Who are the ones who are the long-term players? What are they saying? OK, so the alliances aren't easy. All right. And then Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, um, it's small. Its base is mostly, again, I don't know why it's all oh, California. But, but it has the support of several synagogues, it does, um, of a number of rabbis. And the interesting thing about Jewish Voice for Peace is that this is where the young Jews are going. All right. So i.e., we don't need to overstate it. You, you saw what happened at the Democratic Party convention. Another, I mean, what are we going to say? My gosh, you know, how could you, you know, how could you be so low? All right, and and you know, okay. So it was. What can I say? Uh, uh, um, I could think of this election as um, uh, a very, from a very defensive point of view. Once again, all right. Um, I really do think that there is a worse of the two choices. All right, but you know, the great choice isn't so great. All right. Having said that, so what does it mean for us, or how do I see that? It's. Really, it means the same thing, building our movements so we have more of a voice. As we build our movements, our voice will get stronger. It's not the same. You all know that as it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. It's not. On a grassroots level, I go to Nebraska regularly. My in-laws are all there. They're all Republicans, every last one of them. Ranchers. Farmers, they didn't talk to me for the first 10 years. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm married now 37 years, just celebrated our anniversary. So and my in-laws didn't either very much. But after the first 10 years, it's a piece of cake. I don't know what, it's, what happens after 10 years. They started to talk to me. Now, we go to Nebraska, they call up, we want you to come to dinner. I'm talking about people, you know, people are, are those of us that are my age, our age. And, it, and, and I want to tell you, the discussion is um, not shallow at all. And, I'm, and, and this is how, in Unadilla, Nebraska, they talk about the Israeli-Palestinian thing. Not how I talk about it, how they talk about it. Uh, well, the Jews really have had a rough time. They should have a state. But what about those Palestinians? Why, why are Jews doing this to the Palestinians? I.e., they are, they, you don't have to explain this issue to them. They understand it, all right? And their question is a classic American practical question. What do we do about it? You know, you can't tell us what to do about it. Why are you, why are you here for dinner? All right? <laughs> all right, I think that's what's going on on the grassroots level. You can forget that when you're watching, you know, um, the Democratic Party convention, or needless to say, in the realm of the media and the big institutions, they still have their power. But it's not like it used to be. It's changing. I wish it would change faster, too. Yes? What do you make of the Democrats putting the Jerusalem division back into their platform to keep it against Israel and the Palestinians? Not even that. Requiring two thirds. Yes. Well, I was trying to allude to it subtly. And as my wife says, subtlety has never been one of my better qualities. I thought it was craven cowardice. Craven cowardice on the part of the president. I'm really ashamed of him that he, had, that, that, that he did this. I don't know how else to say it. It did not represent the thinking of the delegates at the Democratic Party convention. And we have seen something like that right here in Colorado. 
at the state Democratic and almost a, a replay of, uh, uh, of that, i.e., uh, a bill was introduced. Maybe some of you were involved. I have a hunch you were. Um, I saw it once before it went to the floor. It wasn't bad. It was a end the occupation, Palestinian state. It was moderate. You know, Israel have it right, whatever. And they took, you know, a voice vote. <laughs> the voice vote supported the resolution. So you can't do that anymore. <laughs> OK, so what, again, what we're seeing here in Colorado and really throughout the country is on a grassroots level, something is changing. On the level of power, political economic power, we've got some work to do. What else is new? All right, what else can I? Does the hypothesis make sense? Uh, this thing about is uh, that's mostly what I OK, good, yes. They don't talk, you know what? It's very interesting you ask that. If, uh, again, you know, it's totally informal and it's anecdotal. I mean, i.e., it's, you know, we got to be careful about saying there's a big trend there. But I'll tell you, when I talk to these folks about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, they're to the left of me on it. They, I mean, and they're just so frustrated uh, with, with how things are going. But I've heard that from people in the State Department for 20, 30 years. Uh, um, they don't like to talk about Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so so uh, they avoid that. And so, you know, so that's what I bring up all the time, me being me. Um, OK. Are we all finished or? Uh, maybe two more. All right, sure, sure, Charles. Oh, I actually do tell them what to do. I tell them. Uh, I, I tell them to write their Congress. I tell them to write their Congress people to 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 push for a two-state solution. I tell them to call for cutting military aid to Israel, which several of them have told me they have done. All right. And when they say why just Israel, I say shouldn't we cut it to the Palestinians too? I said you could do that. They don't get very much anyhow. <laughs> and I, I, it's very frank the discussions, but they have done it. And you know who really? I mean, here's this guy who was r quite conservative. To put it mildly, their former senator, Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel was good on this issue, all right? It wasn't bad. And, and I'm convinced it's because, because his constituency, uh, uh, you know, that somebody's pushing him to take that, take that issue. And he wasn't bad on the war in Iraq either. He wasn't bad. So here are these Nebraska Republicans. They were against going to war in Iraq. And their position on Middle East peace is not bad. You know, I, I, I try to give them some kind of actually concrete answer. There was another hand I didn't see. Yes, Pat. No, I didn't see it. Did they talk about uh, who did it or what was the circumstance of it or? Or the economic uh, uh, problems. And, um, and We're well, good. I mean, politics in Israel are so crazy. It seems yes. to get crazier, crazier, crazier. Where are they going, do you think? Uh, They're not going in a good place. Um, the, in Israel, it just seems to move forever to the right. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, my, I, I am in contact with uh, about a dozen Israelis. Um, and the, the one who, who, I mean, I don't always agree with him, but I just respect the heck out of him, is Avneri, Yuri Avneri. I think he's worth reading. He's really profound. Um, but what you see happening to the peace movement is becoming smaller. The role of, of, uh, of religious uh, elements in the country uh, growing, whatever else Israel was, it was more, tended to be more secular in its past. So I see it, the direction it's heading is very disturbing. Um, and, and, you know, I'm worried about it. And of course, what can you say about 
Netanyahu and all this hysteria about Iran. Uh, I should say, maybe I'll finish with that. What's all that about? Number one, uh, um, as someone who's involved in a coalition to try and stop an attack, for a long time I've believed that Israel would not attack Iran and that what it's trying to do is to get us to do it. Yeah. All right? And even if it doesn't get us to attack Iran, what does it get as a consolation prize? Bunker buster bombs, you know, just, just a tremendous amount of more military hardware, gets more integrated, in, uh, gets more integrated into, into NATO, and pushes the political discussion um, as it has been able to do here in the United States to the right. So that the question of attacking Iran is not a question of, of if, but when. Oh, we'll wait till after the elections, okay, but all right. So that's really, you know, a really insidious role. I see Israel headed in a, you know, just very disturbing direction, even more so than in the past.